today. Our next speaker is uh, Byron Joel, and he is speaking on the sovereignty and servitude in the age of surveillance. And Byron Joel is an internationally recognized author, media presenter, and leader in the field of ecological agriculture. For over 15 years, he's worked, consulted, designed, and taught across four continents. He has over 1,000 hours teaching, presenting on regenerative agriculture in Australia, the USA, Africa, and New Zealand. He is the author of numerous articles and has been interviewed as a guest on the world's leading forums, including the Sustainable Masterclass Series, Regrarian's Talk, Sustainable World Radio, the Permaculture Podcast, the Survival Podcast, and more. He also hosts his own podcast, The Octarian Tree, which focuses on the meaningful connection between humanity, ecology, and spirit. When not traveling the world like a real agricultural Indiana Jones, Byron acts as a managing consultant for oak tree designs, focusing on the Mediterranean regions of his home nation, Australia, where he advocates for a greater recognition, honoring and implementation of indigenous Australian land stewarding practices. Hi, Byron. Thanks very much for joining us today. And uh, I'm going to hand directly What's across to you. You're very welcome. So, uh, yeah, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I was very uh, flattered when I was uh, asked to join in. I've been watching the first two talks and they were incredible. I really uh, resonated with the first The first talk. It was remarkable. I, um, and it really... Uh, is quite aligned to what I'm going to be speaking to. So I'll quickly, uh, I'll share my screen because I've got a little bit of a slideshow. Tell me if it works. Let me have a look. Has this, has that worked? It is, had started, but I'm, sort yes, of. it's come up now, perfect. But it's in, uh, it's in. Okay, cool. It's in, um, not in presentation mode yet. Okay, that's strange. I've put it on. Now it is. Put now it... it's in presentation mode. Okay, great. Okay. great. So, sovereignty and servitude in the age of surveillance. Now, there were a million different things I could have said about this when I was asked to assist in a, a critique, a review of the Great Reset. There was a thousand directions I wanted to go in, but. Uh, to me, one of the most important aspects of where we're heading, one of the important, most important questions outside of the environmental and the agricultural or aligned to it is one of sovereignty and autonomy. Because that's the one thing, the main thing that I see missing from the discussion from the top down. Um, there's certainly a lot of, of uh, people and presentations and reviews and captions from the top down discussing the environment and mentioning social welfare and lots of, lots of topics at the moment. But there's one, this is the one thing that to me is like a deafening silence in that realm is a discussion on sovereignty and autonomy of individuals, of collectives, whether it's, you know, communities, families, or regions at large. So I'm kind of going to be focusing in that direction, of course, with discussion on the ecological and environmental issues as well. So very quickly, yep. Hi again, my name is Byron Joel. I am from Southwestern Australia. I have a consultancy company called Oak Tree Designs, and I've, I've spent the last 15 or 20 years doing regenerative agricultural design. I have a working relationship with projects in Morocco. And uh, yeah, my, my keen interest is in the Mediterranean climate regions of the world. So here we are, this, this great reset, as I've discussed just before, Things are less than ideal at the moment, and this is indeed an opportunity to grow as it's presented by the Great Reset. We have this opportunity of us to, to turn things around and consciously create in a direction that is 
beneficial and moves away from the most deleterious aspects of culture that we've been living in thus far. Um, and there is a lot of emphasis on the environmental and human welfare, social justice issues. But I've actually noticed a great deal of suspicion from people. Like, I don't know if anyone has gone to the Davos website and to the YouTube channel and watched the videos and read the entry. It's really worthwhile because if those comments are any indication, then people are extremely suspicious of this thing. So skeptical and suspicious. Um, much more than I thought they were, certainly much more than has been advertised. But um, when you start paying attention to the kind of media trends and what is and isn't broadcast, it's actually not surprising. That old saying that the revolution will not be televised is still true. In fact, it's more resonant now than ever. Um, Quickly, my main my main critiques of this are, and I will go into it further. That I see it as a, you know, it, I should say actually, I should say, while people are critical and suspicious of it, and myself included, has to acknowledge the face value at least of it being what it claims to be. That the marketing, the way that this is marketed, it it maybe it's it is as simple as that. These are concerned people, quote unquote, experts in these agencies who are genuinely well motivated and interested in using this crisis, this pandemic as an opportunity to move forward. That may very well be the case. So I'm not insisting that there is some grand conspiracy or that one who works for one of these agencies um, is in on the game, but um, I, it we, it, this deserves our critique. It deserves a good critical looking at. So my main critiques are that they're going to be something of a death blow to actual cultural diversity. Um, that it continues to focus on global markets as opposed to local markets. Um, it, that we are at risk of creating a really dependent, a population dependent upon the welfare that is proposed, the UBI and, and so forth. That's necessarily an exclusively negative thing or you know, a negative thing at all at large, but there is a risk, I think, of creating greater dependency upon the authorities' centralized systems. Um, yeah, again, I'm just not sure if, I, I, li I really wanna get clear on whether or not the, we can in fact trust them the marketing that this great risk that is this benevolent proactive attempt to make the most of this profound eruption to an outdated system um are we actually witnessing uh, the whitewashing and greenwashing of something else going on a consolidation of power the question needs to be asked so previous great reads this is the first time in a while that we've had a great Real, conscious reorganizing of society in as quick a uh, time frame, time period as this. I'd say the first time before this was probably World War, post World War II, when um, the UN was formed and two gen one generation of people had seen two world wars in one time and were adamant to not to let things like occur again. So there was a conscious um, to to change systems around the world. Before that, it was the industrial revolution where you see you had people being removed from village lifestyle, from pre-industrial conditions in the UK in particular. And the entire social order was reworked. They were removed from their villages and moved into ready-made cities and towns, industrial camps, and set to work in, in the factories. And before you can keep going back through time where there are all these great disruptions to culture. Now, I live in a place where in Australia, where it's very obvious, disruptions to culture are very obvious. Not only the disruption to the culture of the indigenous people here, which is acute and obvious to anyone paying attention, uh, the gravity and breadth and depth of the interruption to their 
the post-colonial way of life is in it. And you can see what happens to a people who have their traditional or indigenous way of life interrupted. There is a great deal of disorientation that occurs. On the left here, this picture is actually an engraving of the Picts, which were the people native to Northern England at the time, what is now Scotland. Uh, and they were describing, they were actually uh, likened to North American Indian people and covered in tattoos and body paint, and mostly naked most of the time. Romans arrived, that way of life was interrupted. So one thing that occurs, pardon me, one thing that occurs <clears throat> regardless of the positives or neg other negatives that happen to a people once they have a great and profound interruption to their way of life, Sometimes there are good things. It reminds me of that Monty Python's that what have the Romans done for us lately. I don't know if, you, if anyone's familiar with that, but they're having a conversation about what the Romans have done for them lately, they're critiquing the Romans as a colonial power. And they keep coming up with all the like positive aspects of the infrastructure and educate, da, 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 da. So there are, po there are positive things that occur during great periods of great change and appropriation. But what the one thing to me, it's resounding negative is it apparently, it seems like every step of the way when there is a great reshuffling, a great reset, as they have happened before, there is a reduction in local autonomy. There is a reduction in the sovereignty of individuals. There is a reduction in the, uh, the robustness and, and strength or resilience of local culture and regional identity and regional culture. So we're dealing with at the moment these, these ideas being handed on down by numerous non-elected agencies around the world. Um, some people call it technocracies or the, techno the technocracies terms like surveillance capitalism being thrown around but the being the the agencies from which is the great reset is being delivered to us are in fact non elected agencies and again with every step of with every step towards a uh, these new orders out of chaos there seems to be a further consolidation of power centralization of power there is actually a move now it continues towards uh, the global marketplace. This is one of the other things that concerns me greatly about the Great Reset. Um, as was discussed in the first talk today, this continued movement away from local systems, local resilient systems, and the kind of absurdity of the global market, the issue of food miles, um, like here in Southwestern Australia, on the right here, this image was from the logging in Southwestern Australia. So um, the wheat belt region in Southwestern Australia, if you look on Google Earth, you can actually see the area that was logged for the wheat belt. And it was only about 10 or 15 years ago that the wheat belt overtook the Amazon rainforest as the world's largest contemporary deforestation event. Now, it's not really discussed. It's not talked about a whole lot. But they took this Mediterranean woodland and they cleared it at the rate of somewhere around a million acres a year. Land, land, older, land owners were subsidised to clear a million acres a year to grow wheat and sheep. Now, that logging continues to occur uh, further south and um, co and west coastward in the Cary and Mary and Jarrah forests of the world, where the Forest Product Commission does so at a loss to the taxpayer. The Forest Product Commission is actually subsidised to log at a loss to the taxpayer. Now, most of these products sit in next these these X trees once they're logged are chipped 
and they sit at like Bunbury Port in shipping containers, waiting for the market to decide when it is somewhat feasible for it to be shipped to Japan, to be turned into these wood chips to be turned into paper, to be sold back to Australia as paper. Just this, these ideas of these absurd marketplaces um, actions around the world. Like in the first discussion, it was mentioned that, you know, fish caught in one place uh, are shipped to the other side of the planet to be processed, to be sent back. It's the same here in Australia, Southwestern Australia. There's huge vegetable growing regions in the mid, mid north, like Kununurra, where they grow all these vegetables and they're all shipped to Perth where they are then cleaned and processed and put back in into trucks and sent back up north to be sold in the supermarkets. It just doesn't make sense. It's absurd. So there is a phenomenon known as the ethnosphere, which was coined by um, anthropologist Wade Davis. And the ethnosphere is defined by him as the sum total of all thoughts and intuitions, myths and beliefs, ideas and inspirations brought into being by the human imagination spawn of consciousness. The ethno ethnosphere is humanity's greatest legacy. It is that place, quote unquote, that state, that realm in which all of the human imagination and actions and ideas and thoughts and cultural practices and myths and stories are all held. Um, and these are in fact human beings, the, the, it, is, it is our art of living. It is the way in which they are the artifacts of these deep, deep human connections between a people and themselves and their environment, their immediate environment over prodigious periods of time, right? I mean, what, what is a human culture if not the art of living as it interfaces with the surrounding environment? And that, that is something that's not appreciated. In fact, this is my main gripe. It's that this is not appreciated. Now, there's all sorts of lip service around the world that we're built now to, um, environmental degradation and ecology and good group absolutely that's something we need to pay attention to because we are going backwards we are in trouble and people get very very upset rightly so when a species becomes extinct or is threatened and that's understandable and it's good but we don't seem to be so upset or indeed really give a shit when a unique human cultural form is lost and they are dying off at an incredible rate, you know, not in not just little cultural forms, not just like a particular way to mend a fishing net, but like entire languages, entire language groups, and with them, their ontologies and their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Epistemologies. Their entire like sciences, entire frameworks of, of seeing the world, of decision making, entire lenses of human potential are being lost now at a rate of not equal to or perhaps even faster than um, the uh, parallel ecological degradation that's occurring at the moment. People don't really seem to give a shit because they don't know about it because it's not advertised a lot. You can tell a lot about an agency by what they sanction and what they promote and what they keep very quiet about. Now, I'm, and I'm very concerned about this particular thing um, because, because what are we if we do not have these articles handed down to us, these artifacts of the ethnosphere handed down to us? Like these are our birthright. This is the kind of metaphysical toolkit that we should be inheriting and I would, I would like to have inherited and I would like to see passed on to further, further generations. We've forgotten that ecology is the foundation of agriculture and agriculture is the foundation of culture. And when I say agriculture, I don't mean cultivating the field, 
as we know it now, but I mean, use it in a broader sense of the term. And I would, I wish I had another term, but I mean that human ecology interface, the ways in which humanity as a collective, the ways in which we interface with the natural world around us in order for us to obtain everything we need to sustain material being and more. Ecology is the foundation of agriculture. Agriculture is the foundation of culture. The human enterprise is an ecological enterprise. And it's only because relatively recently in history, we've had access to relatively cheap and affordable and extremely full fossil fuels. So we can with lights on and off, right? We can turn taps on and off. We can get in the car and drive 20 minutes what it would have taken us two days to walk. And we've lost our, well, we are losing our capacity to understand what I call like an ecological accounting. And we are considering ourselves foolishly. We feel that we are, we have been rendered immune to the realities of ecological consequence or we're not. We're not. And in the process, we've we're discovered reality that we're living in now at the peril of the ethnosphere. <clears throat> now, if all the talk of diversity, and this is the other thing we get a lot of lip service about ecology and the thing, diversity is the other. What's being sold to us now as diversity is imagine if you're sitting down to a banquet dinner, like a degustation meal. And there's 12, 12 courses being served up to you. Everyone is exquisite and they're all completely different. And that, you know, and you take the time to really, you know, smell and look and taste each one of them. And you go through each, each uh, course and there's wine pairings and it's, you're having a really good time. I hope I'm painting that picture. And then that's diversity. That's true diversity. What I've been to swallow is diversity now is if you took every one of those courses, every one of those dishes, put them all in a blender, blended it up, and it's being handed to you as a grey brown milkshake thing, goo, and you're being told to swallow it. And if you don't swallow it, you're, there's something wrong with you, you're dangerous, you're some kind of thug, right? Now, all the talk of diversity that we're getting at the moment is merely rhetoric. Yeah, sorry, all the talk of diversity we are getting lip service of at the moment is merely rhetoric if it doesn't recognize or work to conserve the deep value, legitimacy and autonomy of the countless diverse traditional cultures found across the globe, born of this like sacred and deep relationship between people and the land and the land habit evolving over prodigious time periods, right? It's very important we pull our shit together and recognize that this is, is, this is one of the most uh, endangered things at the moment. So what the hell are we gonna do about it? Bioregional administration, to, it's not the be all end all, you know, this is a tricky thing. I'm not, you know, it's gonna take a lot of discussion, a lot of thought, but me, bio, the, there's this topic of bioregional administration. There's an excellent way that we can start fostering this discussion again. Um, so what is a bioregional? Basically, uh, it's an area of land, a region that shares the similar or the same um, climatic and meteorological and geographical um, traits. You know, I'm, I'm from, Southwestern Australia, for instance, where it's a the Mediterranean climate bioregion. It's like a Mediterranean climate like bioregion. In the north, there's a hot summer. In the south, there's a cool summer, but it's all Mediterranean. Okay. Um, and then when you zoom in further to that, there are watersheds, right? In terms of like smaller regions, smaller localities within a greater bioregion are the watersheds. So again, born of the relationship between humans and the place that they've involved in are these ingenious agricultural systems that have never been given the light of day, really. They, they, they don't receive the attention they deserve. And I, me and 
myself and some colleagues are working on it. So in this slide, for instance, you have the Shenampas of Mexico in the top left, which is in my opinion, the most uh, regenerative slash sustainable agricultural system ever devised after the Nile, I'd say after the Egypt's Nile, but that wasn't quite invented. They kind of stumbled upon that. The Shenampas, however, uh, are the, uh, it's human uh, designed. You have the rice paddies, the, the rice duck fish systems of many places in the tropical world, Asia and Southeast Asia. You've got the great oasis, Palmyria oasis of the Middle East and North Africa region. You've got the Dehesa, the great Dehesa of Spain and the Iberian Peninsula where they run pigs under their oak trees. Um, and of course, here on the right is uh, where the Los Valles Plateau project in China where they actually re rehabilitated a desertifying valley system the size of Belgium, give or take, in a very small amount of time, relatively speaking. Um, so it is possible when we actually we actually put our mind to it and we figure out these regenerative design principles, we can be as pro, as as positive an influence on the environment than a negative one. And there is a great impulse now towards back towards sovereignty. Um, it, it's again the, this revolution will not be televised, and if it is, it's not televised well because this the movement back to sovereignty the impulse people have to say, you know what? No, we are not just a cog in a giant machine. We are us. And we have a deep connection to this place and each other and our identity matters. We matter to us. It's not some backward caveman thing that we need to evolve out of having a regional identity. It's not, it's about relationship with place and each other within place, okay? It's not some, it's not just nationalism. I mean, nationalism can be a thoroughly shit thing that we need to grow out of. But on the flip side, just because of people in a place say, no, we do not want to be ruled. Just because like the Catalonia, Catalanians, for instance, a, a few years ago, they said to Brussels, no, we don't want to be ruled from Brussels. There's some bureaucrat, however many thousands of kilometers away, making decisions for us about how we farm or about what qualifies what what qualifies as a bloody tomato in our marketplace, you know, or, or whatever the decision may be. You know, so they actually held a referendum and the majority of people wanted out. Of course, it wasn't recognized by the EU. Same with the Irish, with the um, Lisbon Treaty. The Irish voted no originally. They had to go and sneak another referendum in there. Are you sure? You know, with a whole lot of marketing in the meantime, Brexit. I mean, for all of the negative things I hear about Brexit and what it means about the British people, I mean, they all must just be for thugs, right? It's like, no, I, to me, it seems like a, they were a people. That's, that was democracy in action. There are, these people decided they wanted to be them. They wanted to make decisions for themselves. They didn't want Brussels making the decisions for them. You know, Brussels, London, Washington, these, you know, in Australia, it's like Canberra. I'm in Southwestern Australia. What does some pen pushing bureaucrat in Canberra know about what I have to do out in the, you know, the moist sclerophyll forest of Southwestern Australia? They, they don't. So I've got a little project called Sibling Regions Project, um, and it's about fostering mutually beneficial relationships between communities based on climatic, uh, climatically analogous bioregions. So around the world, there are all these, wherever you are around the world, as this map shows, this is from the Regrarians Handbook, there, wherever you are, there will be other places around the world, world that uh, have analogous climates. And um, then the sibling regions concept is an eco agricultural reinterpretation of the sister cities or twin towns practice. However, unlike those conventional couplings in which a diplomatic relationship is forged between two settlements from different nations in order to just strengthen political or economic ties, this sibling regions project intends to couple climatically analogous 
and culturally compatible places from around the world so they can enrich one another through the exchange of appropriate and applicable agricultural, agricultural and ecological um, land management techniques. So this is very much, it comes under the greater bioregional administration discussion. Um, and um, this I see as a, a, a way that we can, we can foster culturally, cultural practices that are appropriate to the ecologies that we're in, right? That, that are actually like, adjusted to the ecological realities of our environment, but at the same time, creating very, very strong relationships outside of our immediate region, that based on, based on the similarities of ecology and the different cultural forms and, and, and uses of different species and whatnot that come up as a result, as a um, result of this practice. This is on the Oak Tree Designs website. There's a full legal written about it. Um, there's a lot more to that, but I think I'll leave it there. Um, I'm at 29 minutes and 30 seconds. So I think I'll wrap up now. If that we works still have another guys. five. We have another five minutes if you would uh, like to take another five minutes as well. Yeah, okay. Well, something I was gonna add if I had time was, um, Again, I find it really interesting the things that are sanctioned and promoted from the top down and those things that are left aside and not promoted. Remember, the revolution will not be televised. Now, this is just one regenerative technique that needs to see greater appreciation. It's called holistic management and it's the work of this man up here, Alan Savory. Um, and he, in my opinion, as someone who's been working in the eco-agricultural sector for 20 odd years, he has cracked a serious code. And the means that the means of holistic management to, to mimic the ways in which, like down here, you see these huge herds of large grazing ungulates, they have a beneficial impact on the environment. And we're living in a world now where desertification is spreading like a cancer throughout many regions of the world. That is a serious issue. Desertification is a serious issue because it grows upon itself. It feeds itself. It's a self-enforcing negative feedback loop. It needs human management. It, it, it needs human management. Or we re-release and re-establish those areas with huge herds of grazing ungulates and the predators that prey upon them, because that's key to this discussion. Can't quite go into the deep nuts and bolts of it now, but holistic management is something that, that the powers that be from the top down, if they were really, really interested in em employing people, regenerating land and Green high quality food in a world where you know factory farming is a reality and an ethically abhorrent one and that we move out of that practice then holistic management is something that's definitely I, I definitely uh, promote the um the uh, looking into of and lastly <clears throat> i'll just say that <clears throat> we are at a crossroads right now the great reset is correct when they say that uh, we are at a crossroads and this is in fact a great opportunity to decide in which direction we want to move. Again, the environment and social justice and human welfare and indeed animal welfare, all those things are of great importance. Just be very, very careful when it comes to sovereignty because I don't believe in an utterly free market, right? But I'm also very, very wary of over-regulation and what it can do to people. You just be very, very, very wary of how we're going to play this game. Yeah, capitalism is falling, it's crumbling, and we need to find an alternative and quick. But all of the uh, alternatives that are being put to us as a viable alternative, they aren't viable alternatives. I actually believe that 
whatever system, if there is a system that saves us in a generation's time or what have you, it's not going to be capitalism. It's not going to be socialism. It's a different name. We haven't come up with it. It doesn't exist yet. And hopefully it has the best of all of those, all of the above. To just be very, very careful because in order, if we think that we need top-down action to save the world, well, then we're going to have the bureaucracy and large government and regulation to, um, to make it happen. So if we don't get off our bums and take our power back as individuals and as communities, then they're going to have to do it for us. And that's when things go horribly, horribly wrong because tyranny can come in green as well. All right, I'll leave it there before I start, before I really start ranting. <laughs> Thanks very much, Byron. Um, so thank you for giving us this very grassroots perspective, uh, you know, particularly from that permaculture lens as well on, you know, the, the challenges that we're currently facing on the planet and also some of the solutions to those. Um, you know, uh, very much resonated with your comments around, you know, loss of cultures and ethnicity, ethnicities and uh, the lack of awareness and lack of uh, perhaps even care that people have um, around that. Also your comments around, you know, the, the, the type of diversity through monoculture. Um, I like to think of yeah. it like a soup. Is it a blended soup or do we leave the vegetables chopped and intact? So, um, yeah, com completely... Yeah. Um, completely agree with all of that. A um, couple of questions for you that have come through on the chat. Um, are there sure. ex examples of thriving bioregional economies? What would be some of the first steps to create th thriving bioregions? I don't know of example. Oh, I do. I can think of one actually. Um, after the um, GFC 2018, is it 2018? I've gone blank. But after the GFC, the financial crisis, Spain and Portugal um, and Greece were hit hardest, if you recall. And Spain and Portugal got really creative. They had to get creative. They got really creative and they took the dehesa system, which I actually mentioned in another slide. So the dehesa system is 4 million hectares, give or take, of pasture, rangeland, where people run their sheep and their cattle and predominantly pigs. And they do a bit of, you know, they grow a bit of wheat there and other things. But it's not just bare naked grassland. It's overstood by a productive oak savanna, right? And it's a semi-domesticated system. And it's 4 million hectares of it. It's huge, right? Um, and it's got, it's bloody beautiful. It's one of my most favorite things in the world. It's just exquisite. So they actually took these, the Dehesa system, which was degrading due to neglect at the time, and they kind of combined their food tourism and agro-tourism and uh, eco-tourism and fostered a whole new kind of wing, the regenerative agricultural tourism, which I think has a huge future. And if anyone from Southwestern Australia, like, political administration is hearing this right now give me an email because there's we've got ideas and it needs to be taken more seriously but so they melded all those things those things together right so now that this this region where they've fostered the regeneration of the dehesa system an appreciation of its human cultural heritage an appreciation of its um, agricultural abundance and fecundity and, and ability to uh, produce uh, high quality food in a way that really regenerates ecological function and people go there you know there's bird watches and there's the odd hunt and there's like the Iberian lynx which was critically endangered is coming back now that would be a really good example of of fostering a bioregional um, economy as for like the steps how do you do it well the sibling regions project is actually that's we're, we're working through that right because it's it's all in the article on the oak tree designs website but we're going to work through it further to further refine it, the systemized systemization of how you would actually work through this project process to identify a bioregion foster the bioregional identity and economies and then the next step forward is to form these relationships with climatically analogous communities around the world 
Great. Okay, and another question for you. Have you seen examples of successful preservation of local culture and how it has impacted the community? Mm. I, my mind immediately goes to the time I went to Morocco and I was meant to be doing a 10 day course there. And you know, I was teaching the, the villas in the Rift Mountains there. And upon arrival, I mean, I always ha already had some misgivings about m myself doing that at the time. I was like 35 and I was going to teach these ancient rural peoples about it, like practical regenerative agriculture, of course. And it just, it was freaking me out. And, but then upon arrival there, I got really like, my heart sunk at the prospects of it. And I was like, what am I even doing? Like, I, just, I had major imposter syndrome. So I completely scrubbed my curriculum and spent three days just getting to know them. The whole course was me just tell me about you, tell me about yourself, tell me about yourself. And by the end of it, like I had such a great, well, a much greater understanding of who they were and how they'd been affected by certain things in, in immediate history and recent history and going further back generations to generations. And, um, we, just, we, we went into great detail about how they lived, you know, the inputs, the, the outputs, everything. And eventually I said to them, like, I just tried to like encourage them to be proud of who they are and where they were from ostensibly. And, and I pointed out to them because the kids grew up there and they want out, right? So there's, there's, some, there's poverty and it's understandable. They want out, but they, they dream of this kind of like, coca-cola starbucks fantasy and it doesn't exist and i was trying to show them that that's what happens with the rest of the world and we're losing these cultures and please be proud of yours and whatnot and i think it made a real impact on the youngsters hearing me uh, uh, outsider say that to them and the old folks were so grateful that for that and at the end of that um call they actually went to they started holding talks to reinstate their old traditional um, common land, commons law practices, which was really amazing. Um, sometimes I just think people need to be reminded who they are. Yeah, we're, we're an amnesiac species. We're forgetting who we are, real shame, you know. It's the sense of or lack of self-worth that comes with that. It's a real killer. Yeah. Well, really great story, actually. And um, uh, I think just uh, symptomatic of so many cultures actually around the world. If, yeah, really great. Um, another question, final one. Uh, yeah. we'll given just, that you have... We'll just that, that blended soup, that grey goo. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, since you have a background in permaculture, what yeah. is the role do you think that that, that in particular will play uh, in, in this sort of alternative to the Great Reset? In particular, permaculture, I see as a stepping stone forward into a new relationship with... I, I'm really interested in the relationship between humanity and ecology and then humanity and spirit. And I think we're suffering from... I, I actually... This might sound like an you know, over generalization, but I actually believe that the majority of pathologies that humanity is, is expressing at the moment, even the, down to the physical, is the result of a lack of meaningful connection between humanity and what we call here country, land, ecology, Gaia, and the spirit, right? And it's not easy. It's not like you wake up and decide you want to connect with guy more and you walk out the door and walk into the bush naked and live happily ever after and all the birds land your shoulder and you just you know that's not what happens so it's like i see permaculture in particular as a really like gentle re reintroduction going back i can always i have to catch myself saying a movement back to a connection. No, no, no. It's moving forward into a new relationship with, yes, a reconnection, but a new relationship with humanity 
be, uh, being a human in connection to place and ecology and being able to read read the landscape and um, all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So it's not that um, going backwards uh, and losing some of the good progress that we've made, but rather a moving forward and integrating uh, old practices that we've lost, yeah. which uh, worked. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you very much for your Ideally, time today, Byron. Both well. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank